Today's reading is chapter, or Mark chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them, and when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is the word of God. One morning, the telephone rings at the church office on the other end of the line. There's a a person who asks, is this the pastor speaking? It is. This is the internal revenue service. We're wondering if you can help us. I'll try. Do you know Herman O'Gillanerthy? I do. Is he a member of your congregation? He is. Did he donate $10,000 to your church? He will. (laughs) Well, look, we Christians can laugh at ourselves. We admit our humanity. And we admit there's a little bit of thief in every one of us, and some of us have a lot of it. That's why God gave us a commandment, you shall not steal. And as Christians, we know that there is accountability. There's always accountability with God. And here on earth, there's accountability with our uh, authorities here, in this case, the IRS, and also with a rather opportunistic pastor. But, But what is concerning and downright unsettling is what our faith in Jesus Christ is attacked with sarcasm, slurs, and lies, and then it's excused as humor. About a week ago on the TV program, the ABC TV program uh, called The View, two of the co-hosts made some rather disparaging remarks about the vice president. You see, they were responding to what a former White House staffer had said about the vice president. They said that Mike Pence is somebody you have to be worried about because he thinks Jesus tells him to say things. Well, now, despite the fact that Mike Pence is well-known, I believe, Most people know that he is a sincere and practicing Christian. Well, despite that, Joy Behar, she remarked, it's one thing to talk to Jesus. It's another thing when Jesus talks to you. That's called mental illness, if I'm not correct. Hearing voices. Well, many Christians, Christians got upset at that statement. And what they did was a number of them called ABC to complain, according to the Media Research Council, some 25,000 people called. They complained, and they, they demanded an apology. Well, the vice president himself, he described Behar's remarks as evidence of how out of touch some in the mainstream media are with the faith and values of the American people. He said, I'd like to laugh about it, but I really can't. Now, Pence also took to Twitter a little while later to to further talk about his faith. He said this. He said, I do try and start every day reading the Bible. My wife and I try to have a prayer together before I leave the house every morning. 
but I do think I'm a very typical American. I think people of all different faith traditions cherish their faith in God. Well, finally, last Thursday, Behar decided to make a, a, a statement, but it wasn't an apology. Here's what she said. She said, I don't mean to offend people, but apparently I keep doing it. It was a joke. Well, you decide whether or not it was a joke. Well, why am I talking about this? Because this is typical of the growing and open attacks against Christianity that is fostering ridicule, discrimination, even persecution of believers right here in our own country, right here in our own community. And last October, as Ben alluded to, last October, our, our school was notified by the board that administers the Boost program that the $80,000 of scholarship that they had originally just two months before, awarded to Trinity, was being rescinded. We would not get that $80,000. Now, the Boost Fund is a state program that's aimed, it, it, it's supposed to be used to provide non-public education to underprivileged young people who, for some reason, and it's very strict criteria, they cannot get the kind of education where they are. Well, we have 21 students like that under the Boost program. But it was brought to the attention of the board members that in our handbook, in our school handbook, there, there's some wording that could be taken as discriminatory in either uh, admission or in our operating policy. Now, we were never given a chance to, to respond to that. They held a secret meeting, didn't tell us when or where, decided to withdraw the funds, $80,000. Now, we have never discriminated. We've never discriminated against anyone because of their faith. We are a Christian school, and that's what we teach, but anyone can enroll here, and we're not going to discriminate against them during the time that they're here as a student. But we were not given a chance to explain. Now, since then, we have we've adjusted the words. We haven't changed how we operate, but we've adjusted the words so as not to give anybody a, a bad impression. But those funds are lost forever. Now, it may be that we, since we've made that adjustment that next year we, we might be funded. And by the way, the 21 students that were here under that program continue to be here, and we educate them without the scholarship. Let me share one more blatant act of discrimination that I have personal knowledge of. I know of this individual, a Christian person, fine, upright Christian person. Now, she was at work, a supervisor as a matter of fact, and this, this Christian supervisor was talking to a fellow employee that or co-worker that uh, was also a very close friend. And in their conversation, faith came up and she expressed her conservative Christian faith, which, which we espouse. Well, she was overheard by a third employee who reported her to personnel and said that her faith made her feel like she is going to be discriminated against. So they called her on the carpet. They they spent a couple months investigating, and they did all. They they reprimanded her, and and she lost some financial compensation as a result. And the reason given was, well, you did that. You talked about your faith on company time, and it could give some could give someone the impression that you might discriminate in one way or the other. You see. Now we're being accused of what we could do, we might do, and then action is taken. Well, Jesus, Jesus does talk to us. He talks to us, how? Through his word. The Holy Spirit inspired this book. The Holy Spirit speaks to us in various ways. He speaks to us through our conscience. Sometimes he speaks to us through other people, as I've said. 
Jesus does talk to us, and he's told us that we can expect this kind of mistreatment and even worse. Our lesson from the Gospel of Mark that was read a few moments ago, it follows immediately behind the account of Jesus asking his disciples the question, who do you say I am? And Peter, typical Peter, he spoke right up and answered, you are the Messiah. Well, if we run over to Matthew's gospel, we get more of that, uh, that story. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not overcome it. Jesus said he would build his church on the rock. Now, the rock is not Peter. The rock is Peter's confession of faith that Jesus is the Christ. He is the son of the living God. And Jesus goes on to say that even the gates of hell, that's all the powers, all the powers of sin, death, and the devil will not overcome the church. It will not defeat its mission. Well, yet right after commending Peter for his confession of faith, Jesus tells, he tells the his disciples, not to tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that I'm the Messiah. Now, why? Why did why does he do that? Well, I think in the last several weeks, both Ben and I have, have mentioned that. We call, it's called the messianic secret. The reason Jesus didn't want people being told he was the Messiah because the people of that time, as well as the disciples, were wanting, they were expecting a worldly Messiah, someone very special, sent by God with some special powers that was going to unite the people, be a, a, a new king like David, and help them free themselves from Rome, the slavery to Rome that they were, they were enduring. But Jesus didn't come as that kind of a worldly savior. He came as a spiritual savior. He came to save them and us from slavery to sin. And it would, take, it would take his reaching out to people, calling them back to God. It would take his, his preaching and his teaching, his healings. It would take, eventually, it would take his very death on the cross and his resurrection and his appearance to the disciples. So for the first time, but not the only time, Jesus spoke plainly of what was going to happen to him. And that's where our lesson picks up. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Now, I don't know where we've gotten this from, but we, we kind of visualize Peter as being a big guy. He's often called the big fisherman. Can you imagine? Peter goes over to Jesus and he puts his arm on him and says, Come here. Hey, look. I don't think you understand what a Messiah is. <laughs> yeah. Let me tell you. Well, Jesus will have none of that. Uh uh. He's in charge, not Peter. And then Jesus turned and he looked at his disciples and he rebuked Peter just a few moments ago. He was commending him. He said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Now, remember last week, if you were here or if you heard the message, we heard how Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. He was tempted by who? The devil. How was he tempted? The devil tempted, tried to tempt him with popularity, with riches, with, with power, if he would abandon his mission on earth. <laughs> if he would... He would give up trying to save men and women from death and hell. Well, in actuality, Peter is doing the same thing. That's why he called him Satan. But he wasn't doing it out of evil intent. He was doing it out of, out of wishful misunderstanding. Well, then Jesus, Jesus calls the crowd to him along with his disciples 
Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. Now notice something. Jesus isn't talking just to his disciples now. He's calling the crowd. He's talking to them because I'm sure some of those people there were considering maybe, maybe I should become one of his disciples. And we know that there were other, other followers of Jesus besides the ones we know by name, specifically. Many of them dropped off after this. No, he called them all together, and he wanted to let them know what it meant to follow him. He says, you have to pick up your cross and follow me. That would be the same today as telling you or me, you have to pick up your electric chair and follow me. Now, both of them are forms of execution. I don't know for a fact, but I, I, I'm pretty sure that the electric chair is a rather fast way to, to die, but not the cross. Mm -mm. The cross was a slow, painful, torturous death. That's where we get the word excruciating. We talk about excruciating pain. We get that ex word excruciating from crucifixion. And many of those who were crucified were beaten, scourged first. And it could take, in some cases, days for them to die. Well, the disciples will come to understand that their mission will require their total commitment. Their mission is what? It's to spread the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. Simply stated, the good news is the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he came here because of the love of his Father God, so that we, we could have the redemption we need, that we would have the forgiveness. It would take his life. It would take his, his death. It would take his resurrection. But the disciples did come to understand. Eventually, they came to understand. When Jesus appeared to them after he was dead, and talked with them, ate with them, they understood, and they were on fire for the gospel. We know that of the, the 11 disciples that were with Jesus at that time, and we can, we can add the apostle Paul, he was living at that time. Well, those 11, 10 of them, along with Paul, all, all of them died martyrs' deaths, painful, horrible deaths. Only one did not, as far as we know, and that was John, the Apostle John, but he, he spent the remainder of his life in exile. Well, it costs, though. Being a disciple does cost. Beginning with the first believers, ever since, there has been and there will be persecution until Jesus returns. The words of Jesus to his disciples and the crowd that day, they, they, need to be, they need to be heard and heeded by his followers, by us today. Jesus said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous, that's another, another way of saying idolatrous, and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. My friends, it's becoming more and more difficult for us to live out our faith. You know, in some places, some places in the world, thank God not here, not yet, a person who claims, who lives as a Christian, can be jailed, beaten, tortured, even executed. Now, we can try to play it safe. We can put our light under a bushel. We can try to hide our faith. We can go along with the world. As a matter of fact, uh, if we do, we can avoid ridicule. We can avoid discrimination and persecution. We may even, we may even do pretty good for ourselves. Huh? We can be pretty popular individuals. We can have some earthly wealth, lots of it, may even get a big job with a corner office. Who knows what we could get? But we will fail. We will fail in our purpose here on earth, which is to glorify God. We will fail 
in our mission to share the gospel with others so that they can have that same forgiveness and eternal life that Jesus offers to us. And from what the way I read what Jesus said, we can even lose our own salvation. Jesus doesn't insist that we forego every pleasure of life. Heavens, no, because <laughs> all things come from the Lord. No. No, but he does want us to turn our lives over to him. That means living according to his word. That means understanding that our time is his time. Our possessions are his possessions. Our abilities are to be used in the way that glorifies God. And that way is according to his word and according to his way. Now, dying to self and living for 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 Jesus Christ, it's the best life we can have. And it can start, it can start very simply. It can start by a recommitment. But with that recommitment's got to be followed with some, some action. Let me tell you something. I'll tell you where it can start. It can start when you're watching TV tonight. And you got that remote control in your hand. Most of you keep it there anyway. You got that remote in your hand. And something comes on there that's vile, that's evil, that glorifies violence, that makes a mockery of sex, that criticizes Christians. It's a button there. It says, oh, push it. And then if you want to do more, which you can, very, and you should, get a hold of, get a hold of the TV station. Tell them you don't like that kind of programming. You can tell them, and you can also tell their sponsors. Their sponsors react rather quickly when they, they get a, a number of, of complaints. Look, we have a voice, we have a vote, but we have to use them conscientiously. We have to use them in a Christian manner, in Christian love, and I mean that. We have to use it constructively and compassionately but it's going to take much more risk, more sacrifice, more love for Jesus Christ and more love for one another. Is it worth it? I mean, let me ask you something. Where do you want to spend eternity? I'm not saying we have to earn. We're never going to earn our salvation. Jesus has already granted us that. But my friends, if our faith is real, we should be living that way. Does he have a right to ask us to do that? Of course he does. He gave his all for us. I know I would think just about everybody here knows that Dr. Billy Graham passed away this past Wednesday. Well, on his 99th birthday back in November, Billy Graham released a video encouraging people to seek God with their whole lives. It turned out to be his, his final public prayer for the world. He said, I've been praying that we might have a spiritual awakening. I think that becomes possible only as individuals surrender their lives afresh and anew to Christ. Now, he went on to share some advice about how people can truly live the Christian life. He said, first, we must do everything we can to follow in the footsteps of Jesus live a life in which we love one another, we help one another, and we live according to his word as Jesus lived. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us live that new lifestyle. It's one of love, gentleness, and patience, and all of these things that are the fruits of the Spirit. My friends, let us pray that when Jesus Christ returns as the judge of the living of the dead, that he's not ashamed of you or me. And meanwhile, meanwhile, let, let us not fear for one minute that the evildoers of this world are going to win. No, they're going to have some temporary success. They've already had some. They're going to have a little bit more. But you know, we have God's word. We have his promises. I've read this book and I know who wins. It's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He wins. And I have a message this morning. I'm sure it won't be heard by those I wish they would hear it. 
Those who spew their sarcasm, their slurs, and their sneers on those of us who believe in Jesus Christ. Those elected officials and those appointed ones who deny our God-given and constitutionally protected religious liberties. Those self-appointed vigilantes of political correctness. I want to tell them something. They are out of their league. For the last 2,000 years, tyrants have persecuted the Christian church, and they have not overcome it yet. And our Lord Jesus Christ promises. Our Lord Jesus Christ promises that even the gates of hell will not prevail against his church, and that includes you and me. Amen. Please stand for prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, give us, this, give us your Holy Spirit in a new and powerful way so that we will indeed turn ourselves over, not, not part of ourselves, not just Sunday morning, not just certain hours of the day, but wherever we are that we will turn ourselves over to you, that we will be witnesses, we will be observant of the rules and regulations that our government has, has imposed on us up to the point that they violate our faith and our, our following your will and your ways. But Lord, we need courage and we need strength. Your son has promised that he would never leave us or forsake us. He's promised us that he would be with us even to the end of the age. As we claim that promise, fill us, fill us with your Holy Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks for watching. Trinity Lutheran Church can be found at 1100 Philadelphia Road in Joppa, Maryland. You can also find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you like this video, go ahead and click the like button. That's a thumbs up button right here on the YouTube page. And you could also be a big help to us if you'd go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you very much, and God bless.